now we know that evolution is impossible, it is only the creation which is the truth. Now, how do we know about creation? There are two ways. God has revealed about creation in two ways. The, the first one is called the general revelation. Okay? The second one is called the specific revelation. What is the difference between two? The general revelation is when you look around the world, when you look at everything which exists, uh, the common sense will tell us that it demands a creator. If there is anything that exists, it demands a creator. That is called general revelation. Look up in the sky, the millions of stars, or look at small things like leaves. What the intricate structure of a leaf or a cell or a DNA, all these intricate structures will <laughs> convince you that they all require an intelligent creator, an intelligent designer. Okay? So this is called general revelation. When you look at the created things, that gives you a, a silent message that there is a creator. There's a verse in the Bible, let's look at that verse. Romans chapter 120. It says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. See? This is the general revelation. Look around, and the things that are made from them you would know that there is a creator. Next verse, Psalm 19, 1. Psalm 19, 1. Next. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. When the psalmist looked up in the sky, he saw that there is a creator of God there. But it is so sad that many people cannot understand that, right? Look around, the common sense requires that there would be a creator God. Actually, it's, it's a simple logic. There is a good verse in the Bible that talks about this logic, which is Hebrew chapter 3, verse 4. Look at this, how logical this verse is. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. Don't you love the logic in this verse? We don't see many logical verses like this in the Bible. I, I love this verse. Every house is built by someone. But he who built everything is God. See, what a perfect logic. Right? This logic is called, uh, in another word, words, in um, science there is a law called, the law of cause and effect. For every effect there should be a cause. Without a cause there will not be an effect. And this is what this word talks about. Every house is built by someone. Right? So this is the general, general revelation. Anybody can understand this. But beyond this we cannot understand any through, anything through our uh, understanding or our logic. We can only understand there is a God who created everything, but that's it. If you need to know how God created, who He is, He has to reveal Himself. Without that revelation, you would not be able to know anything beyond this point. That is why we come to the next uh, uh, next topic, which is the specific revelation. God knew that general revelation is not enough. People will come to a point where, from which, beyond which they cannot understand anything. So it was necessary for God to give the specific revelation. And where did this, where is that specific revelation contain? In the Bible. That's where God revealed himself, right? But there's a difference. The general revelation you can understand by logic, but the specific revelation you have to take by faith, right? The Bible has to be taken by faith. Because the Bible is given as a revelation, it is up to each individual whether you want to take it by faith. Some people say, no, we don't want to take it by faith, so they just discard it. But those who are spiritually wise, they will take it by faith. Let's look at the next verse, what the Bible says. Hebrew chapter 11 verse 3, it says, By faith we understand that the words were framed by the work of God. You see that? Not by logic. 
but by faith. We understand the world was made by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. This is a scientific statement. The world which is seen today, which we can see today, is made by things which are invisible. Isn't that amazing? What is the world made of? Atoms. Right? The, the ultimate particle is atom, which is invisible. Or you can think about energy, which the universe is made of, which is invisible. So uh, we don't know what uh, the author is referring to, but whatever he's referring to scientifically is correct. The world is made by something which is uh, invisible for our naked eyes. Now, see, as I told you at the beginning, it requires faith to understand how God created everything. Here it says, by faith we understand that the worlds are framed by the word of God. If you look at the general revelation, would you ever know that it was created by the word of God? No. Only in the Bible it says, we understand it is created by the word of God. How do we know that? Genesis chapter 1. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. The word of God. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the, the waters. He said. And then God said, let the earth bring forth grass. Then, the low, then, then God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures. So God said, God said, God said. So that is what here says, it was formed by, it was framed by the word of God. He said it and it was created. So this is why we need a specific revelation. So now you understand the importance of both. The general revelation and specific revelation, right? But specific revelation requires faith. So sometimes we are accused of having blind faith, but actually it is not a blind faith. It is a logical or informed faith, right? We have a logical or informed faith that the world, the earth, the universe, everything is created by a creator. And that revelation is in the Bible. That is why Bible is very important. And, and let me tell you one more thing. And that revelation is only in the Bible. If you look at all other religious books of the world, they talk about creation, but the information is scattered everywhere. You had to pick from here and there, and they don't even match. It is only in the Bible, the first 11 chapters have been dedicated to educate us about the early history of the earth. What happened from the beginning? God created, then there was a fall, sin entered, and then there was a great flood of Noah's time, all those things, it is only in the Bible systematically, comprehensively given. So when you uh, talking about the creation, the Bible is the only authoritative book. You know the meaning of authoritative? From the author. Who is the author? God. God is the author who created everything, so no wonder the Bible is the authoritative book. So we should take the Bible serious. So this is about the revelation, how we know about creation. But once we know about creation, what is, what are the lessons we need to understand? So I'm going to walk you through those 10 lessons. The first one is, uh, next slide. I understand that God is the first cause of everything. Once you understand creation, the first lesson that you will agree with, that God is the cause, first cause of everything. Um, Genesis chapter 1-1, one, one. next slide, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. When the Bible talks about heavens, that talks about the whole universe. God created the whole universe and the earth in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. That means the first cause. Our God is the first cause. That's the first lesson we learn. Now, you know that uh, skeptics and atheists, they always have been, to, have been trying to discredit this first verse of the Bible. Because they knew that if, if they are able to destroy that first verse, then the, the rest of the Bible is gone. People will not take it serious. They always have attacked this first verse. They tried to bring up so many other alternatives to claim that it was not God who created anything. It all happened by itself. And you know, that is how the theory of the Big Bang came up. And that is what's being taught in schools today. 
But you know what? The, the more and more scientists discover the new theories they come up with, they more and more resemble the creation. That is interesting. That's very amazing. As more and more uh, newer theories come up, they come closer to the creation account of the Bible. Let me give you a um, let me give you what I mean. Uh, give an explanation about what I mean. Now, the Bible says in the beginning God, but these evolutionists wanted to replace God with matter. They said in the beginning not God. In the beginning it was matter. So they uh, imagined that there was a cosmic ball of matter. And in that matter, there was a big explosion, and then, uh, then everything came up. So the Bible says, in the beginning, God. The evolutionist said, in the beginning, matter. Right? For a long time, that was the, the accepted theory among scientists. But recently, many scientists themselves have started questioning that. They started, coming, uh, they started realizing that the matter cannot be eternal. Matter could not have existed forever. Right? We believe God is eternal. Right? God is eternal. He, he existed forever. But matter cannot be ex, uh, eternal. So they came up with a new theory. So listen to this new theory. This is very amazing. So now they believe the newest, uh, the newer um, Big Bang theory believes that in the beginning or at the beginning there was a nothingness. Think about there is no matter. Okay? There was a nothingness, and in that nothingness, there was an explosion. Isn't that uh, ridiculous, funny, to believe that there was nothingness in that, there was an explosion? But that's what they believe now. Right? And they say, in the nothingness, there was an explosion, and five phenomena came up. There was matter, energy, time, motion, and space. They say that these are the five basic phenomena that makes the whole universe. This is the latest theory. But it is very interesting that this latest theory comes very close to the creation account of the Bible. Though it is still an evolutionary theory, they don't uh, put God in it, but it's interesting how close it has come to the Bible. Um, in the first verse of the Bible, you see all those five phenomena. Look at this. In the beginning, which is the time, God, his Word is the energy, creative, motion, the heavens, space, and the earth, matter. You see that? All godless scientists today agree that these are the five basic phenomena that has created the universe. And though those five phenomena are clearly alluded in the first verse of the Bible. Okay? So what I'm trying to say, now I'm not giving any credibility to the Big Bang theory that is still an evolutionary theory that has nothing to do with Bible, but what, what I'm trying to say is the newer theories or the newer real, realization brings bring those people closer to the Bible. As the Bible says, at the end every knee will bow down, bow down before the Creator. They will all acknowledge that He is the Creator. But we don't need to go through all these things. We have accepted by faith that God is the creator. But this is always good to know what is happening in the world. How the things of the world are changing. How the theories of the world are changing. And we should never try to accommodate those changing theories with the Bible. And many believers have done that. And they have, um, they have seriously compromised with the teachings of the Bible. As, you, as I gave you an example of... The, the Sunday school teacher who has been teaching about theistic evolution. That all happens because we, when we try to accommodate those changing human theories with the unchanging word of God. We just need to stay true to the unchanging word of God. Okay, I'll uh, go to the next lesson, uh, lesson two. I understand that God has authority over the earth. If God is the creator, it's logical that he will have authority over the earth, right? And we understand that. But many times we, uh, we, we prefer to think that probably Satan has authority over the earth. Satan has authority over the whole world. Where did that thinking come from? That came from an incident in the Bible where Satan is tempting our Lord Jesus. 
Satan took Lord Jesus to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and told him, you bow down and I'll give you all the authority over these kingdoms because these authorities have been, the authority has been given to me. Let's look at that verse which is um, uh, Luke chapter 4 verse uh, 5 to 7. There it says, and the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you and the glory for this has been delivered to me. Do you think the devil, the Satan was speaking the truth there? Oh, no, I don't think so. Nowhere in the Bible it says that any authority has been given to Satan. No, it was a false claim. You know what? But what Satan is doing today is, he is exercising authority over the, in the minds of the people who are in rebellion with God. So he is the God of the rebellious world. That's true. <laughs> That is why in many places Bible says uh, he is the prince of the world, he is God of the world. In, in the minds of the people who are, rebellion, who are in rebellion against God. But God never gave him this authority. Who did God give the authority? That we read in the next verse. Matthew chapter 28 verse 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. You see that? Who has the real authority? Satan claimed he's a liar. Jesus said he has been lying since the beginning. He went to the garden and lied. So when he said, bow down to me, I'll give you all authority to Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus he did not even question him. You don't need to question a liar. You wouldn't win by questioning a liar, right? Jesus ignored. But the Bible clearly says who has the real authority. So we can take comfort in this fact. When you understand creation, you will definitely understand God is the author. God has the authority over the world. There is another good verse in the Bible, uh, Daniel chapter 4 verse 25. You know, when Nebuchadnezzar was, uh, was proud, arrogant, Lord, uh, God said that he will be sent into exile until you know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men and give it to whomever he chooses. Now you see who has the real authority? Many times we think that Satan has the authority over world leaders. Satan can only influence them. But Satan cannot change the course of the history. The course of the history is decided by our God. He is the one who decides who will be reigning. Especially when it comes to... Uh, the people who can make policies to influence the nation of Israel. Because our God is always concerned about what's happening in the Middle East. Okay? Many times we are confused. We don't know what is happening. What is happening in Syria? The, the, the migrant influx into Europe. We are perplexed. We don't know. But the Bible teaches our God is in authority. So we, sh we can take comfort. We can definitely know that nothing is going wrong or nothing has gone out of the control of our God. He is bringing the world into a position where his son will appear and he will take charge. So that is the, that is the great lesson we can learn from the creation account. Our God is still in throne. He's still in charge. Next lesson, number three. I can trust my Bible literally. Why do we need to come to this point? As I told you, when this um, the, the theory of evolution has got much popularity, some people thought that the theory of evolution is right. And they started mixing or accommodating the theory of evolution with the Bible. When you do that, what happens? You come to a conclusion, the Bible is not literal, the Bible is figurative. And then you start thinking, those six days of creations are not probably days, probably millions of years, six ages, and those kind of figurative interpretation you bring into the Bible, and uh, then you end up with a lot of compromises, a lot of compromise. That is the problem with theistic evolution. That is why we need to teach our people what the truth is. Because false materials are available. You cannot stop our young people uh, from reading them. It is available on the internet, in the market, everywhere. Usually false materials are more available than the true material. This is why everybody should be aware of the true, uh, true interpretation of the Bible. 
That is the literal interpretation, not the figurative. Uh, there are two verses, but you could skip them, and uh, I'll just move to the next. Uh, <clears throat> uh, th these verses talks about the, the reliability of our Bible, which we all accept, so we can skip to the next lesson. Um, lesson four, I am created in the image of God. Now, if theistic evolutionists, those who believe that God allowed evolution to happen, to create the world, they think that we were allowed to evolve slowly. If that is true, we are just a higher kind of animal. Right? But the Bible teaches that's not true. What does the Bible say about our creation? The next verse. It says, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Look at the created word. How many times it has been used there? It is not that God allowed evolution to happen slowly. Right? If God allowed evolution to happen slowly, you know what the, con the, the implication is? The implication is we are just like any other animal. And what's, when we look at other animals, we know that they don't have any spirit. But we are different from animals in having a spirit. When you have a spirit from God, that is eternal. That is not destroyed. So we should take that aspect seriously. You are not dead and gone like an animal. Because we are created in the image of God. Look at the next verse. Ecclesiastes chapter 20 verse 7. It says, and the dust returns to the ground it came from, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. It is serious. Serious. Those people who are fooled by evolution are really ignorant of this fact. They don't understand there is a spirit within them. They will be really surprised when they come to the to the moment at their death. And they find out that they, they are still surviving. Because most of them are in the misunderstanding that by death they are done, finished. Just like animals. But when they find out they are after death, they are still continuing. They will be surprised. But this is the fact. We have a spirit that goes back to God. And depending on what we did with Lord Jesus in this life, our eternity will be determined. So let's be uh, serious about this issue. Let's go to the next lesson, which is uh, lesson five. I am accountable to God because I am his creation. Next. This is a fact most people want to ignore or avoid. You know why the theory of evolution is very popular? Just because of this. Because once you accept you are the creation of God, a, a creator of God, you are accountable to him. Right? And most people don't want that. How good it is to think that, no, I'm not accountable to anybody. I'm just going freely in this life, enjoying my life. I'm not accountable to anybody. That thinking satisfies many people. And that is why they find the theory of evolution very appealing. Because the theory of evolution tells them, don't worry about your spirit. Don't worry about any God. You are not accountable to anybody. You are just an animal. A highly evolved animal. And just like any animal, you will be done. You will be perished. So they take this life uh, more meaningfully. They say, Make more meaning in this life. Earn. Enjoy. Because tomorrow, there is nothing. But that's, that's a trap. That's a trick of Satan to fool people. But when we know that we are accountable to God, the next words, we should be paying attention to some verses in the Bible. The Bible says that believers as well as unbelievers, both will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Sorry, before the judgment seat. Believers will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and unbelievers will stand before a white throne judgment. Nobody will escape. Why? Because we are created by God. This is scary, this is serious, but this is the truth. We cannot run away from it. 
what is about believers? It says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. But when you connect with other verses, mostly we understand that at the judgment seat of Christ, the work which is going to be judged is mostly the, the work which we did for our Lord Jesus. Okay, what was your intention when, we, when you were uh, in a ministry? Was it to glorify Him or was it to glorify yourself? All those things will be checked on that day. And those who come out through that fire, they will receive the glory. And those who, uh, those who have everything burned up, they will be saved but just like through fire. That judgment is not to determine anybody's salvation. If salvation is secure. You are saved forever. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it is clearly said that day will come like a fire and your work will go through fire. If everything burns out, burns up, still you will be uh, saved just as through fire. Okay? So there is some comfort for us that our salvation is secure, but still there is a scary uh, warning that we should be faithful to our God. But what about the unbelievers? The unbelievers think that they are not accountable to God, but they are seriously mistaken. Very seriously. Look at this, Revelation chapter 20. Here it says, Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it. And I saw the dead, small and great standing before God. And books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the book. And anyone not found written in the book of the life, book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Unbelievers will be judged based on two criteria. The first is whether their name is in the book of life. That is the fundamental criteria. If you did not believe, did not accept Lord Jesus, your name is not in the book of life. The second thing, they will also be judged based on their work. Okay, so that gives us some ground to believe that there will be difference in degrees of punishment in hell. Punishment will not be the same for everybody because it says they, they were judged based on their work. There will be differences in the degrees of punishment. Just like there will be differences in the degrees of praise and honor that we receive in heaven based on our work. Next um, lesson we learn is, um, I should honor the first institution established by God. What is the first institution established by God? Marriage, family, right? And many of us never connect marriage with the creation account, but actually marriage is the integral part of the creation account. If you believe in creation, you cannot avoid that message. If you read chapter 1, chapter 2 of um, Genesis, you cannot avoid that message. Let's look at what, what God did in the first marriage. Okay, it says, And the Lord said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper, compar comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, and, he, and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. This is the, the marriage account, the first marriage that took place. And there is a verse in the Bible, which is Hebrew chapter 13, 4, next verse. Marriage should be honored by all, right? But we are living in a world today where marriage is not being honored in two ways. Let me explain in two ways. First, people have a growing thinking, and this is among Christians. Let me warn you, it is among Christians, not among Muslims or Hindus. They are still true to their the custom of marriage at least. But among Christians, a growing 
belief, uh, there is a growing uh, trend of belief that marriage is not necessary. You know what? We see a lot of young people. But based on this, we need to understand marriage is, necess marriage is important. Because God said, it is not good for a man to be alone. Right? And when should marriage be considered? The, but the, this account clearly says, when a man is able to leave, leave his father and mother and be joined to his partner. That is the time a marriage should be considered. Many of our young people, though they are able to leave their parents and start a family life, they keep delaying, which is not the biblical principle. Okay, so marriage should be honored. That's one thing. We should take care of that, parents as well as children. Uh, there is a the right time for marriage. The second thing, marriage is being despised among worldly people today by breaking God's standard. God's standard was a man and a woman. Right? But you see what is happening in the world today. It is no more the union between a man and woman. I have read a funny statement that keeps coming on the internet again and again that God did not, God created Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Right? You understand the meaning of that? Adam and Eve, a man and a woman, not two men, not two women. Right? God has a clear pattern of marriage and we should respect that. Next one. Uh, seven. I understand that the death is the result of Adam's sin. That is the next lesson you understand from the creation account. We understand that the death, the Bible clearly says, let's look at that next verse where it clearly says, it's Romans chapter 5 verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sin. It is very clear why there is death in the world today. Because one man sin. When it says that death spread to all, it is not only about men. It's about the whole uh, living, be, uh, living kingdom. <coughs> all organisms. Because when we read in the Bible, we see that before Adam's sin, all living organisms were herbivores. God allowed eating meat only after the sin, right? So that gives us a clue that before sin, there were no death even among other organisms. But you know, those who believe in evolution and those who believe in theistic evolution, even many Christians, you know what they believe? They believe that there was death even before Adam's sin. Why is that necessary for them to believe? This is, this is how it is. If evolution has happened, you know that evolution happens through struggle for existence. There's a struggle for existence among animals, and the, the fit animal survives, and the weak animals, they perish. What does perish mean? That means that there was death. So if evolution is true, even before Adam appeared, before, before millions of years before Adam, there was death existing in the world. See, this is one of the compromises people end up to do when they believe in theistic evolution. This is why I said in the beginning that we need to stick to the right interpretation of the word of God. Because when you start making compromises, you end up in all compromise. Then you end up in believing that the death is not the result of sin. How wrong that is. That's not what the Bible teaches. Right? So, According to the Bible, it is um, death was brought by sin, and there is another verse. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. You now, death is an enemy. It was not naturally put here by God. You know, all other religions in the world, they are not able to explain why death is here. It is only Christianity. It is only the Bible that tells us that death is here because of the sin. So sometimes I wonder how the other people understand their God. If they believe firmly that their God created a world of imperfection, death, pain, is their God reflects the same character? Does do their gods reflect the same character? Like an imperfect God? Because, because the Bible says our God created the world in a perfect stage. Because our God is perfect. He didn't create the world with pain and suffering and death. 
it all happened because of the sin, right? No, no other religion believes that. I think this is the most logical explanation for the suffering in the world. Other religions cannot explain that. So that was uh, number seven. Let's go to number eight. I understand that the universe is under a curse and decay. Let's go to the next words. Genesis chapter 3 verse 17. Cursed is the ground. Our God put a curse on the ground. Next verse will tell you that this curse was not only on the earth, it was over the whole universe. The whole universe is under decay today. Okay, that means disorder is increasing. Available energy is decreasing. You know, in every energy transaction, heat is lost. And uh, these scientists, godless scientists, they say that since heat is being lost, after many, many years, the, the whole universe will end up in a situation called heat death. So they don't have, they don't have anything hopeful to offer to us. They say that it is going, all going to perish. Uh, the whole universe will be in a dark, cold stage in, in near future. Not near future, after many million years. But the Bible has, has, a, has a solution. The Bible tape says that the current disintegration in the universe is put by God there in the hope that he will renew everything. Isn't that a good news? Yes, the Bible has the good news, not the world. This universe is going to be renewed. And sometimes I wonder, in this world of disintegration, how can anybody believe in evolution? Everything is going downward. How can anybody believe that things are improving? That never happened. Leave anything on the ground and watch that after a few months or weeks. Has it improved? No, it has destroyed. It has decayed. Nothing in the world is improving by itself. Because God has put everything under a curse. Let's go to the next uh, slide quickly. Number nine. I admit that there is a sin nature in me and I am in need of salvation. Next uh, verse. Genesis chapter 2 verse 16 to 17. That's where we see that how sin nature came in. God told Adam, do not eat from the tree in the, uh, in the middle of the garden. And they ate from it and that was the beginning of sin. So what was that? He broke a law. When we break the law of God, that brings, that is called sin. But you might say, okay, God gave Adam a law. But he hasn't given me any law. Why should I be worried about that? But that's not true. God has given his law in the Bible, in the Old Testament, when he gave his law to Moses, that was specifically to the nation of Israel. But then the extension is for everybody. But if, you, if people don't agree with that, then there is another way to understand this. God has put that law in the hearts of every man. Isn't that uh, a news? Let's look at the next words. It says, um, yeah, here you read that the Gentiles who don't have the law by nature do the things that the law requires because God has put the law in their heart. So what, what does that mean? That means we have a law in our heart and none of us is capable of keeping our standard to that law. We have broken that law. Okay? We are not, not different than Adam. Many times we tend to blame Adam that it is all because of him. He brought all of us into sin and all that. No, we are responsible too. We broke, broke the law too, which God has put in our heart. Right? And uh, there is a next verse, Romans 7, 15 to 24, where Paul talks about he wants to do good, but he cannot do. So that means there is a sin nature in us. But you know how, how the evolutionists look at the sin nature? They would say, don't worry, there is no sin nature. What you call a sin nature is just an animal nature. Because they would say, you evolved from animals, so that is why you have these shortcomings and you are not able to do things right, correct. That is just an animal nature. That is how they try to console us. That is how the psychologists try to console us. 
If you go to a psychologist, worldly psychologist with any problem, they will try to console you by looking at your worldly side by saying that it is all because of evolution. But you know what? That is wrong. You know why it is wrong? Look at the animals. None of them have any sin consciousness. Look at it. If we evolved from them, how did we evolve the sin conscious consciousness and they don't have it? So it is not the animal nature. Not at all. If it was the animal nature, it should have come from the. Uh, it, there, there should have been sin consciousness in animals too. Have you ever seen any animal building an altar and worshiping God? No. Have you ever seen some animals gathering in a, in a church to worship God? No. They don't have a sin consciousness. We have it because the law is written in our hearts. Okay, not in animal animal hearts. Okay, so that is about sin consciousness. In the last uh, um, uh, last lesson. So in the previous lesson, we understood that I understand that I have a sin nature and I need a savior. That is the clear uh, implication from believing in a creation account. If you believe in creation, you cannot uh, escape this implication. You need to come to the understanding that you are a sinner and you need a savior. Okay. So next, uh, our lesson is, I understand that the creator God has become the redeemer. That is amazing. You know what? The evolutionist would tell us, don't worry about your sin nature. You know what? Man is evolving. It is offensive to call man fallen while he's evolving. Right? And they say, wait for a few more million years. We will be in a higher state. We will be in a super stage where sin would not be a problem at all. And you know where this lie came from? Where, where did you hear this lie first time? In the Garden of Eden. You know what um, Satan said? You will be like God. That is what these people are telling us. Don't worry about this. We are evolving. Uh, there would be a time when we will be in a stage where sin will not bother us at all. So they say, if God had waited for a few more million years, he didn't have to send his son to die. Right? Is that what God thought? Did he want to wait for a few million years to allow the evolution to happen? No. We know that the same day when the sin happened, he made a promise. The same day. He did not want to wait for people to evolve and solve their own problems. What was the promise on the same day? Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. This was the promise God made on the same day. Right? So evolutionist false hope is not real. God gave us a hope the same day. He said the, the, the seed of the woman will come and, and destroy the head of Satan. Right? And who was the seed of the woman? When we come to the New Testament, we see that that was Lord Jesus himself. And who was Lord Jesus? He was the creator. You see the connection there? The creator God became the redeemer. Where do we see that? In uh, John chapter 1 verse 1 to 14. Let's look at that. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. No doubt who is being referred to here. Our Lord Jesus. How do we know that? Um, because in, in later verses say that the word became flesh. So it is about Lord Jesus. And then what happened? It says, all things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become the children of God. What does this passage tell us? This passage clearly tells us the creator was our Lord Jesus. And he came into the world, became one like us. 
He became a man and then he redeemed us. So, the, so what, once you believe in creation, the logical requirement would be for you to believe that a sin has happened, man is fallen, we all are sinners, we need salvation, and uh, when you check in the Bible, the way for salvation is provided by Lord Jesus, who was the creator and became a redeemer. So these are the practical lessons from believing in creation, right? Many people do not look into this, this deeply. They just read through a creation account and, and don't look at the practical implication. But when you look, when you believe in creation account, these are the practical implications you all need to, we all need to understand and shape our lives accordingly. So may God help us to keep these thoughts in our hearts and in the coming days. Be true to the word of God. Understand the word of God literally, not figuratively, but being true to it and waiting for the second coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our gracious Father, we thank you for this uh, wonderful morning you gave us. Thank you for uh, the deep lesson you have given us from your word. Thank you that you are the creator. Thank you that you are the redeemer. You, when we sinned, you did not leave us in our uh, sinful state. Rather, you provided a solution. The creator, Lord Jesus, himself came down as a redeemer. And today we have s salvation because of that. So we, commit, um, we, we appreciate the understanding that we have received from the Bible. And we want to shape our lives around the, that understanding so that our lives would be a blessing in the future for ourselves and for others. We give you all glory in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior Jesus we pray.